Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by William Costello. He just finished his MS in Psychology, Culture and Evolution at Brunel University London in 2021. <coughs> the topic of his thesis was in cells, which you're going to talk about today. Later this year, he will be joining Dr. David Buss's Evolutionary Psychology Lab at the University of Texas at Austin as a PhD student. He will retain an honorary research assistant role at Swansea University. He writes opinion pieces on a range of cultural issues, including gender and identity politics. His work has been featured in Quillette and Aereo, and his academic research has been presented at several academic conferences around the world. So, Will, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to everyone, finally, by the way. Yes, <laughs> thank you, Ricardo. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, during my master's, I was a big fan of the show, for sure. It, it helped me with every uh, academic assignment we had. Whatever topic came up, I knew if I could just YouTube the dissenter, you would have some guest expert on talking about that topic. So you, you really helped me with the master's. So thanks for that. It, it's, it's great to be here. Well, I really appreciate that. That's one of my goals. I mean, to help and reach also students, master and PhD students. So I'm really glad to hear that. Yeah, uh, you're actually on the, the reading list. They actually linked to your podcast in the Brunel um, Psychology Culture. Oh, really? Master. Yes, that's right. So you're official. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they should have told me about that. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, Anyway, let's get into our conversation then. So, sure. incels, because this is a topic many people talk about nowadays, and I guess it's very misunderstood by a lot of people. It's very politicized, and I mean, it is politicized even by incels themselves sometimes. But So, give us perhaps first a definition of what is an incel. I mean, how would you operation, operationalize it from a psychological perspective? Yeah, okay. So, incels are involuntarily celibates. Uh, they're a largely online subculture community of mostly men who forge their sense of identity around a perceived inability to form sexual or romantic relationships. And the first thing I should note before telling you about my research is that when I picked my topic, my colleague and co-author, she always joked to me and said, well, William, you know what they say, uh, research is me-search. So on that, I say no comment uh, about, about my own situation. Um, but incels, uh, the, the reason they kind of capture public consciousness is that a significant minority of incels engage in very misogynistic online hostility. Uh, although one study um, just found that just 10% of incel accounts are responsible for m the vast majority of the online hate, uh, which is, you know, maybe we're judging incels all around by an extreme minority. But an even more extreme minority uh, and rare individual cases have seen incels actually lash out in violent rage and actually uh, kill people in like spree killings. Um, most notable of those is the notorious case of uh, Elliot Roger, who uh, in 2014 in Ilsa Vista in California, he killed six people and injured 14 others before killing himself. And he wrote uh, a 49 page manifesto uh, where he talked about a day of retribution when he would kill those that he was envious of, uh, who he called chads, uh, who she referred to the, the sexually successful men he, he was jealous of, and Stacy's, uh, which meant the attractive women who rejected him. Uh, so his sexual frustration was all over that manifesto and he became kind of the poster boy or prototypical of the incel movement and a lot of media attention on it. Um, uh, and just how typical his psychology is of um, incel psychology isn't really clear to me. Uh, and that's what I maybe kind of uh, sought to seek out uh, in, in my master's uh, dissertation. Um, the question of kind of are incels a movement? Uh, it, it's difficult to define, first of all, what we mean by incel. So there, there are people who are incel, involuntarily celibate, just by pure circumstance. And uh, it, it doesn't really have anything to do with their identity beyond that. Um, but I think that there is a big difference between those who are just incel involuntarily celibate by uh, circumstance and those who lean into the identity. So it, in, it's not clear that incels have agreement or collective goals on 
um, uh, solutions or even the causes of uh, what they see as their problems. There's a wide kind of viewpoint diversity among incels. But in my mind, uh, there is something that could be categorized as like uh, the, the incel worldview. So I, I would say that that's kind of what we would call the black pill worldview. So many incels subscribe to the black pill philosophy or black pill worldview. And that uh, black pill is a derivative of the red pill from the movie, The Matrix. And it kind of suggests a willingness to see the world as it really is, as opposed to the blissful ignorance of the blue pill. Uh, so in the case of incels, the black pill kind of refers to a particularly bleak truth to swallow. And in their case, uh, they believe that sexual attraction is mostly fixed and that there is nothing that incels can do to improve their romantic uh, prospects. Um, so just to give you an idea of how uh, widespread um, the, the, the belief in the black pill is uh, among incels, another big study, um, and not my one, um, found that while only 44% of incels argued that incels needed to believe in the concept of the black pill to be an incel, 94% in that study believed in the black pill themselves. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty ubiquitous kind of um, uh, worldview that we can maybe assign uh, to the incel online subculture. But of course, incels aren't just the online uh, people. There are those who are just involuntarily celibate and may not have ever even heard of the word incel. Mm -hmm. Right. So several questions about that. Um, why is it, I mean, is there any explanation from an evolutionary perspective, because that's where you come from, as to why it, it seems to be the case that there are many more men than women that are involuntary, involuntary celibates? Right, yeah, so this is a, a big talking point among incels. And from an evolutionary point of view, we've always had a, a kind of a greater variability of reproductive success among men uh, than women, whereas like kind of most women will can get a chance to reproduce. Uh, often men are kind of left aside and some men reproduce a lot. Um, so that's always been the case. And at different times, it's been more extreme skew uh, than others. Um, and to point to why there's uh, so few female incels or fem cells, although that community is kind of growing uh, it, it recently, um, I could only attract nine uh, fem cells or female incels for my study, whereas I could get 151 male incels. Um, and incels themselves would kind of believe that there is no real such thing as a fem cell because they would see it as uh, a, a woman, women can just get sex whenever they want. They just have to simply lower their standards. And there's some kind of truth to this that, uh, you know, my, even female friends that I talk to, I say, look, if you wanted to go out tomorrow and find sex, uh, you probably could find it somewhere. You may, it may not be the sex or relationship that you want, uh, but you could probably find it. And they, they tend to agree on that. Um, but I think they're, what, it's a real failure of cross-sex mind reading here because for incels, they see that as a net positive. They think, wow, something is better than nothing. The woman could get some sex, uh, it, even if it's not the sex or love that she wants, uh, the fact that she could get something is better than me. Whereas I see that as a real a breakdown of cross-sex mind reading because for the woman and women I talk to and uh, women will tell you that they really don't like having sex with people they don't want to have sex with. <laughs> like yeah. it's not, uh, like, and I think incels underestimate that. Uh, it's actually a harm inflicted on them to do that because of course, uh, when a woman has sex from an evolutionary point of view, she uh, is potentially risking uh, the parental investment of, uh, you know, perhaps getting pregnant and raising the child and gestating and fertilizing all of that kind of cost on her body and being stuck with the, the child. Uh, and the, the idea of having a child with a man whose genes she really didn't want, uh, that's kind of really repellent to women. So it's actually, it, 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 it inflicts a cost rather than be a net positive. So that's a, a breakdown in communication, I think, between incels and and women. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if we didn't take into account these sex differences in terms of uh, the kinds of mates males and females want to attract and how much sex they want to have and so on, I mean, it would possibly make sense the kind of way 
male incels uh, think about the fact that probably most women, if they wanted, could, could go out on the street and find someone to have sex with. Because, I mean, it's, it's sort of the difference between knowing that if you wanted, you could do it and knowing that you really can't even if you want. Right. Yeah, so the way I describe it is kind of, well, what's the difference between bad options and no options? Yeah. So <laughs> women might be able to get, uh, not find the sex and love that they want but they could find some. Um, but uh, I've kind of grown in my thinking on that because uh, when I consider that it's, it's not, it, it amounts to the same thing. If it's really not what you want, yeah. then it might, might not as well exist. So it's, it, it, they're, they're talking about different prizes. Yeah. So, but is there something that differentiates uh, modern involuntary, involuntary celibates from, I mean, just, celibates that we know always uh, existed across human history. Right. So, uh, like I said, we've always had this greater male variability of reproductive success. Um, but this modern kind of generation of incels with evolutionary psychology being reasonably young, they may be one of the first kind of generations of incels to really grapple with the idea consciously that, oh, wow, my whole identity could be based around me being to some extent considering myself like a, an evolutionary dead end uh, also throughout history we've had kind of institutional ways of dealing with the surplus uh, population of um, unpartnered young men in a society so for example we used to send them to a monastery um, or, or even uh, send them to war as like so vikings would be viking raiders would be an example of maybe what, incel, what we would have done with the population of incels in the past. Now, it's not really a modern solution we can do now of round up our surplus population of young men and send them raiding. Um, perhaps that, that's a good thing. We don't do that anymore. But there was a level of, uh, there were kind of institutions with high prestige associated with even sexlessness. So like the monastery was an, an outlet for, for this population. Whereas now those aren't available to us. And it seems like that modern, modern incels kind of, uh, they, they occupy themselves just online by being in, in, on the internet in online worlds a lot. Mm -hmm. And since you mentioned, for example, priesthood, right? I, mm -hmm. I mean, it, psychologically speaking, it's very different uh, if you are involuntarily <coughs> celibate uh, from being voluntarily celibate, right? Because there are people who become priests and they just don't want to have sex, but that's very different psychologically. Yes, absolutely. And uh, again, the kind of level of prestige when you're willing, kind of sacrificing uh, your sexual opportunities, uh, it comes with a little bit more uh, prestige than uh, than the involuntary kind of acknowledging your uh, in inability. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. So from your research, what would you say are the main psychological traits that characterize incels? Right. Okay. So I can summarize my, my master's research uh, as uh, condensely as I can, but they, we, we covered quite a lot because incels are a really difficult group. They're, they're very cynical of academia, so it's very hard to get at them. So when I had a chance to do one big study, I tried to cover a lot. So the first thing uh, we by, found... by the way, by the way, mm -hmm. before let, let me just ask you, has it been easy to recruit participants that, uh, I mean, express, oh, of course, this is anonymous, but that, that are willing to put themselves forward as incels? Is, is it easy to do that? Um, I think they're more, although they're a little bit cynical and mistrusting of academia and kind of any institutions, they are really keen to kind of get their views across. So if you are someone who's willing to listen to them, uh, they will talk. And I think that they're just kind of cynical because most people are trying to just make them look bad with their studies. And a, a lot of the academic studies that um, certainly before I started my master's that were out there were all just online rhetoric analysis. So linguistic studies looking at their misogyny online, uh, which, okay, are, are in, to some extent useful in my opinion, but a lot of what incels do online is like what I would call performative antagonistic trolling. So they're like trying to 
troll wider society and get a get a kick out of uh, being subversive and um, just kind of making everything a joke. Um, so it's it's not it's not that clear how much you can tell about their psychology. So I was really excited to kind of get one of the first studies. Uh, actually asking in cell participants themselves their views and uh, about a, a range of different things. Mm -hmm. So let's get now into the psychological truths. Sure. Okay. So the first thing that we measured and we hypothesized that in cells would score uh, higher on what's called the tendency for interpersonal victimhood scale. And this is a new personality construct and personality scale uh, that's been developed. Um, and I, I thought it, it, it captured in cells perfectly. It describes an ongoing feeling that the self is a victim and that becomes central to your identity. And those with this victimhood mindset tend to have an external locus of control. So they mm -hmm. believe that their life is entirely under the control of forces outside of themselves. It's comprised of four uh, sub dimensions. Uh, one is the need for recognition. So that's a preoccupation with having the legitimacy of uh, your grievances acknowledged. And that very much characterizes incels. They really want you to acknowledge how difficult they have it and the most upsetting thing you can actually say to incels is often ah oh, come on you're not so bad you could get a girlfriend you just have to do this and to not believe them so the need for recognition is a real uh, big one mm -hmm. they also have the second uh, dimension is uh, moral elitism so the belief that the individual or their in-group behaves more morally uh, than others and you very much kind of see this uh, in incels they kind of almost sneer at mate preferences and kind of uh, look down at women for what they value in a mate and think that it's not quite moral and that they would have maybe loftier uh, ideals. You also have the third dimension, which is a lack of empathy. And that's the belief that because of uh, an individual's past victimization, that they feel entitled to behave uh, and uh, kind of hurt others aggressively and care less about the pain of others because well, no one cares about my pain, so why should I care about yours? And that very much characterizes incels too. And the final one is uh, rumination. So that's a, a preoccupation with constantly reflecting on past instances uh, of victimization. Uh, and that, that final one might actually point the way to maybe some therapeutic uh, avenues that we could explore because uh, there's a new type of therapy that shows a lot of promise called a metacognition therapy. And it's uh, about, it, it describes kind of thinking about your thinking. So thinking about how you're thinking about yourself. Uh, and that has been shown to kind of minimize harmful rumination and uh, has, it, it seems quite effective early on. Uh, so we also measured other metrics of well-being. So incels had significantly lower levels of well-being uh, than non-incels, including higher levels of depression, anxiety, and loneliness. Uh, so to put that into context, 34% uh, of incels in my sample could be clinically diagnosed as severely depressed, with 42% uh, further as moderately severely depressed. So that was using the, uh, a, a scale called the PHQ-9, which is used by the NHS Health Service here in the UK and uh, to, to diagnose. So using that scale, those are quite stark kind of figures. Uh, in terms of anxiety, roughly 67% of incels were severely or moderately anxious uh, compared to 38% of non-incels. Uh, so that's uh, quite strong. And another figure was that 82% uh, of incels said they had strongly uh, considered suicide. Mm -hmm. So the, the, this kind of idea of an external locus of control, um, is, um, it, that came through if when we asked about incels reported reasons for being single. So we hypothesized that because of this external locus of control that they would uh, assign more external reasons um, such as feminism or online dating has made it too hard as reasons for uh, their being they're being single, but uh, uh, an unexpected finding, or perhaps it shouldn't have been unexpected, was that they also assigned more internal reasons too. So they're characterized by blaming others, but also by self-loathing too. So mm -hmm. their, their most popular reasons for being single, their top five was, number one, not good at flirting. Number two, I'm socially awkward. Number three, I'm not good looking enough. Number four, I'm too anxious around partners. And number five, uh, I lack confidence. 
We also found, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, that incels have a significantly lower sense of self-perceived mate value, but uh, self-perceived mate value uh, can be taken as a proxy for self-esteem, so it fits with their idea of low, low well-being, uh, and they were higher on loneliness. Uh, we also analyzed their mate preferences and their perceptions of female mate preferences, so and th that kind of revealed some uh, cognitive distortion. So we asked, we compared incels and non-incel men's uh, perceptions of female mate preferences with some female participants' actual reported mate preferences and see what was overestimated and what was underestimated. So the non-incel men in our study, uh, they, um, they overestimated the importance of physical attractiveness and financial resources while significantly underestimating the importance of kindness, intelligence, and humor. Now, to complicate things a little bit further, the non-incel men in our study also made some mistakes. So they weren't really much better um, than uh, at anticipating or per, um, perceiving female mate preferences than non-incels, but uh, incels were more extreme. They were, they were more wrong. Um, uh, but interestingly, non-incel men uh, overestimated the importance of financial resources more than non-incels, uh, uh, than incels did. So incels thought that financial resources weren't as important to women as uh, non-incels did. And, you know, this, to complicate things even a little bit further, uh, you must ask yourself the question, are they really inaccurate? Is this really, because, you know, there's such a thing as social desirability bias in studies, which uh, mm -hmm. is, is a real thing, but there's also the difference between stated and revealed preferences. So we know from a, a wide body of literature that um, uh, that uh, financial resources and socioeconomic status is important to women uh, in, um, in a mate. So it, it, it's kind of maybe a little bit uh, somewhere in the middle. Uh, finally, some of our other findings were um, that a lot of researchers say that incels simply have uh, too high standards, that they're just aiming too high for their mate value. So we wanted to measure whether this was true or whether it was a uh, just a myth. Um, because from an evolutionary point of view, this would be a bad mating strategy, right? So we, 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 our psychological adaptations are attuned to adaptive self-assessment. So it wouldn't make sense for a low mate value man to concentrate mating effort competing with high mate value men for uh, high mate value women, because mm -hmm. it's... It, um, it's not a good strategy. You're not likely to succeed. Yeah. So uh, our findings revealed that incels had lower minimum standards for their mate preferences than non-incels, um, but they also uh, they underpredicted women's overall uh, minimum mate preferences, and that might be because they're really underestimating the importance of kindness, intelligence, and humor. They just really kind of caricature think that women only want the good looks and the the money so um that that was interesting but yeah they, they didn't have high, too high standards there was no evidence for that we finally one of our other uh, unsupported hypotheses was uh, we hypothesized that incels would score higher on socio-sexual desire mm -hmm. um which they did but we hypothesized that this would kind of uh, mediate the the levels of well-being so we predicted that for incels scoring high on sociosexual desire while constantly ruminating on your inability to act on that desire, that that discrepancy would lead to lower levels of well-being for incels. Uh, but that wasn't supported. It was just low levels of well-being across the board that didn't really uh, mediate it anymore uh, for, for incels. Um, I, so um, you can just kind of think that uh, inability to meet your mating goals is just uh, bad for your well-being overall. Final set of findings, or well, some of the final set of findings for now, and I'll let you ask another question, is uh, we did some exploratory research on kind of like a demographic profile of the incels, and we found that 17% of incels versus 9% of non-incels reported to be neat, which means not in education, employment, or training. So that might have a significant impact on their their uh, ability, if, if, given that we know how much women do value resources and socioeconomic status in a mate, that's really an, an obstacle to them achieving mating success. Um, we found that 36% of incels compared to 20% of non-incels had a high school level of education or lower. And 
roughly 50% of incels compared to 27% of non-incels in our sample reported living with their parents or a caregiver. Now you might think, oh, well, they're likely very young and that's maybe normal, but the actual, the mean age uh, for uh, incel participants in, in our study was 28. So uh, it wasn't, it's not exactly like, uh, you know, they're, they, they should maybe have flown the nest by, by, by now. So, so that's just a, a summary of uh, some of our high, uh, headline findings uh, from our study. And, no, yeah. no, that, that's great. Let me just get, ask you some follow-up questions about that. So first sure. of all, um, when it comes to recruiting these participants, uh, how did you do it? Was it just by self-identification or I mean, uh, for example, are there any objective criteria apart from self-identifying as an incel to uh, classify someone as an incel? So, for example, sometimes on the news we see those statistics about percentage of males that uh, didn't have any sex for the past year or something like that. I mean, w would those also count as, as, as incels? I mean... Uh, do you get yeah. what I'm trying to ask here? If there yeah. are more objective criteria to really classify someone as an incel or if it's just out of self-identification? Yeah, for sure. Um, my opinion on it is, and in my study, I did rely on self-report um, because it, I, I had actually a kind of like a criteria that I would hope would capture incels of like, uh, you know, things like that. How long have you been without sex and things like that? But um I was hoping that I would get enough who just identified because I think that's the real, the real definition. Because the way I would describe incel, it's like enough difficulty with achieving romantic or sexual success that it comes to cause you enough psychological pain that you really that it becomes part of your identity. So I think that identity bit is important in differentiating between oh just circumstance. I don't really think a, a time metric is useful. I think that's interesting from a point of view of what's going on culturally that men are having less sex or, or whatever, but uh, I don't think that captures the kind of the incel like psychological state or even worldview. Um, because if you think during COVID-19, maybe uh, six months, yeah. uh, it, that would have made a lot of incels out of everybody, right? <laughs> so it, yeah. I don't think the time metric is really good because there has to be a difference between like a dry spell uh, versus an incel, right? So that, that's kind of the way I would see it. Mm -hmm. So, and when it comes to the well-being part where you mentioned mental health issues, do you have any idea if uh, it's possible to determine where the arrow of causation points to? I mean, because it could be the case that uh, some of these males are already prone to depression or already suffer from depression, anxiety, and so on. And that's one of the causes of them becoming incels, or it could be the other way around. I mean, it's because of them not being able to find sexual partners that they become depressed, anxious, uh, etc. Yeah, so certainly ours didn't, like, it, we just measured group level differences. So that causation, what is the mechanism here, it wasn't really, like, explicitly found. Um, yeah. But you can kind of, uh, you can infer a bit of meaning there. But I, I think, like you describe, it's likely bi-directional, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, people who are very depressed, they don't make for attractive partners, are very, you know, they're not really motivated to go out and engage with the, the mating market. Um, so I think there's a little bit of that too. It's very, um, the, the incel kind of identity is very, it's like a cycle. So you, you mm -hmm. have this difficulty, then you get this worldview that says, oh, you shouldn't even bother trying. And then you steep further into depression. Um, yeah, it, it could be bi-directional, but that's something uh, I'm not sure because, uh, we, we, we also measured forum using incels versus non-forum using incels. So some of our incels in our sample reported to not using any incel forums and some reported to using forums. And it was a pretty 50-50, um, you know, the, the forum users weren't any worse on the well-being uh, than others. Um, but I would predict that they would be less likely to engage in the mating market because... Uh, 
I've, I've interviewed some incels qualitatively after this, and they talk about how if they talk about romantic success, they, um, they get booted off the forum or it's like, they, so it's kind of like they're dragged down uh, mm. because for other incels, if, if an incel says, oh, I've achieved romantic success, it kind of disproves their worldview. So it's kind of, um, it, it's a, a harmful identity in that regard, but it's not clear to me that engaging in the mating market and going out there and trying to get a girlfriend, that can be pretty anxiety inducing anyway, right? So it's not clear to me that that's the solution of, oh, we need to just go out and get incels girlfriends because you, know, that, uh, you can kind of understand why a really socially anxious incel might retire from the mating market because it can be pretty anxiety inducing uh, and rejection is kind of hard to take. And maybe they have maybe higher levels of rejection sensitivity, um, but you can see how they might get a lot out of the online incel identity. So they get a sense of fraternity, an easy kind of black and white view of the world, um, a kind of funny in-group kind of comical lexicon of language to kind of insult people with, which, you know, it's, a, a, it, it's not nice to see, but you can see what they get out of it. Um, and uh, like uh, finally just like an excuse to not uh, participate in the mating market it's kind of that it's the idea that like a little bit of hope would actually be more dangerous to them maybe than giving up completely so it, it, i think that in there, there are some incels that the forums and the identity might help but there are some incels that um uh, uh, the, the, the the forum like the actual engaging in the mating market could be the more dangerous thing so I have some figures of comparing the incel forum users uh, mm -hmm. versus non-forum users. If I can just pull them up, I can tell you about them. Okay, so 26% of incels uh, in our sample reported to using forums. Forum use did predict greater anxiety, uh, was the only kind of well-being outcome. Uh, in 37% of those that used the forums said that the forums made their well-being much or somewhat better. 39% were not sure, and 24% thought that it worsened their well-being. So a very mixed bag uh, on what they think themselves. What did uh, have some significance among incels, which incels were more likely to uh, have low mental health? Only approximately 20% of incels in our sample believed that they will not be involuntarily celibate for life. So 80% believe they will be involuntary celibate for life. And this belief in the permanency of inceldom was a significant predictor of depression and low life satisfaction among incels. Mm -hmm. So breaking that cycle in therapy could be a, a, an avenue, uh, cracking that nut of it's, you know, cultivating a little bit of hope and cultivating a little bit of internal locus of control. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that's um, a pretty bleak set of findings maybe. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to their self-perceived mate value and mating skills, let's say, do you have any idea if it's accurate? I mean, do you, do you have any idea if what they think about themselves when it comes to their mate value and mating skills really corresponds to reality? Right. Uh, actually, I saw one study that showed that typically people who are unattractive actually aren't very aware of it. <laughs> so th that actually w w would be the opposite. You'd think of, oh, but yeah, I, I tend to think that incels are aware of their low mate value. Uh, or, and I'd love to do a study to actually examine whether it's objectively true or not. I'd, pr I'd perhaps expect that we would find that it's less true than they would say, but it, it ties in with this idea of mating effort. So your mate value, it's quite low if you're not willing to put in any mating effort. So if you're an incel who said, I'm, I'm out, then your mate value it might as well go to zero because you're, you're not uh, trying anyway. Um, but yeah, I would, I would love to measure that uh, objectively because it could be just a, a like a self-esteem issue and it's, it's mate value is kind of like a proxy for self-esteem. Um, but yeah, I would love to, to find out whether it's objectively uh, true or not. Um, Speaking personally, it just, just kind of based on looks alone in, in cells I've interviewed personally, not perhaps as unattractive as you might think. I, I, I didn't, um, you, you know, you, you don't know what to expect, I suppose. But um, 
yeah, uh, but there are objective things like the being neat, for example, and mm -hmm. uh, low socioeconomic status that objectively make them low, lower uh, mate value. And in other studies, incels have reported to be very short and height, unfortunately oh. for me, is an objective <laughs> <laughs> link for mate value in, in men. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a big one. That's a big one. Height is but it's you, really. You mentioned the, the mating intelligence. I think that is a a good um a, a good avenue to explore as well. And I, I know you had um my friend Glenn Gare on on the mm -hmm. podcast talking about mm -hmm. his book with Scott Barry Kaufman on mating intelligence, and that mm -hmm. could be something to cultivate. Um, but it's not easy. It's not straightforward mating intelligence. It, it's um and it, it's maybe a lot easier if you're high mate value, right? And if you enjoy participating in the mating market, even, you know, I always think to be sexually successful, you have to actually be, to enjoy the mating market and even be willing to be rejected a lot. And, mm -hmm. you know, that that's, a, it, it's not that easy. It, it, you can see how incels might shy away from it. Yeah, we'll get into that kind of thing later on in the interview, sure. but uh, you mentioned also uh, mental health care, and I, and I think it was uh, metacognitive therapy, is that it? Yes, metacognitive therapy is a new idea I have, but I also think that in any therapy intervention that we would plan bespoke specifically for incels, and I think mental health professionals are completely ill-equipped to even address or understand this problem from the first, from the get-go, um, but one significant... Um, uh, but, but why? Why? Because, uh, first of all, I think that they would uh, be very dismissive of evolutionary psychology, So, oh, yeah. uh, and to do so is to immediately dismiss and alienate incels. So incels, you can imagine a prototypical example, and this is what incels report to me in, in the interviews I've done uh, of their experiences with therapy, that they go in and they explain about their struggles on the mating market and they start talking about all this stuff with evolutionary psychology and what women value in a mate, which is to some extent right. I mean, they're not like, okay, they hyperbolically use evolutionary psychology and form a deterministic, maybe fatalistic worldview off of it and maybe exaggerate things a lot or leave things out but you know it's, yeah it's also not... because i mean just to interrupt you for a second mm -hmm. also because even in evolutionary psychology we're talking about averages right right and that's yeah, perhaps something they don't uh, take into account yes because they're very like black and white and fatalistic it's, it's easier for them to think this applies to the average therefore it applies to me they don't Kind of see well i will be the one to break the the average and you know per perhaps that's uh yeah they need to cultivate that internal individualistic kind of uh, attitude and mindset but if you have a therapist who completely maybe comes from a blank slate kind of ideology mm -hmm. and is very dismissive of evolutionary psychology on political grounds or ideological grounds anyway and they immediately kind of dismiss the, the incels real problems that they really face and represent in society, they've immediately lost rapport with a client. And uh, with uh, therapeutic interventions, the relationship between the therapist and the client is the biggest predictor of success in that intervention. Nothing else, just the positive relationship. So keeping that, not making incels feel gaslighted when they talk about their real struggles uh, you know, the incels have always said to me in, in the interviews, they feel their problems have been minimized or even not acknowledged at all. And if we go back to our finding about this tendency for interpersonal victimhood, that uh, need for recognition is completely not being met at all. Uh, it's not being taken into account. And uh, yeah, I feel like it's just immediately dismissing and uh, alienating incels in therapy. So I think there's a role to maybe inform mental health practitioners about the incel problem specifically, but also an evolutionary psychology informed therapy. I think that would be useful for couples therapy for, for many things, but um, uh, it, it, certainly for incels and the relationship with the therapist. Mm -hmm. Also, I don't know if that would uh, have any influence, but because nowadays <laughs> people are praising singlehood a lot and there are those studies coming out i'm not sure to what extent they are reliable but saying that 
many people, some of them say up to 50% of people who are single are happy being single. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure if that would also contribute to the idea among clinical psychologists and other mental health professionals that uh, it's just okay being single, there's no problem with it. I mean, yeah, it's okay if you are okay with it, but of course, from an evolutionary perspective, it makes lots of sense for you to worry a lot about being single and not being able to attract mates, right? Absolutely. And, you know, just that idea of a therapist kind of suggesting a solution of, oh, Life is so simple. Just don't care about the thing you care about. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's like you're upset about being single. Well, well, you could just be happy about being single. Have you ever tried that? <laughs> you know, it just, uh, it, uh, it, it, it seems like, uh, and uh, also this kind of celebration of singlehood feels co- somewhat ideological too of, uh, you know, how, oh, what's her name? Emma, Emma Thomas, uh, the, the one who played Hermione Granger in Harry Potter. Uh, Emma Watson. Emma Watson, yeah. She had a real splash expose about how she was uh, dating herself and, you know, empowered and things. And I thought, wow, compare that to the way we report on incels or even MGTOW, uh, who, who may be, okay, a bit more toxic in their language and stuff. But um, it, it's definitely, it, it's not as celebrated in young men, maybe. Yeah, this is probably a problem that is common both for incels and people who become ideological about singlehood and any other kind of arrangement. Because, I mean, if it works for you, that, that's fine. I mean, if you're happy with it. But when you turn that into, oh, it's better to be single or it's better to marry yourself or whatever. I mean, yes. that's just silly. Yes, I'm quite libertarian in my own view myself of just different folks, different strokes. I, I hate when people kind of, uh, y- you know, kind of proselytize about what people should do with their own romantic or sexual life. <laughs> I, I'm a kind of a freedom guy on that front. Yeah, but I mean, in order to also try to help incels deal with their own situation, how do you think people should think about them? Because there's lots of I mean, negative thoughts about incels and people just socially speaking uh, bad, bad mouth them a lot. So and and I mean, to some extent, because of their uh, particularly the ones who are more politically motivated because of their behavior, people are not that wrong, at least to some extent. But I mean, just to try to be fair here. But what do you think people should keep in mind when it comes to their psychology to try to be a little bit more understanding? Let's say. Yeah, I think uh, the first thing we should try to trivialize the topic a little bit less. It's kind of become a, a trivial joke topic uh, in kind of online discourse where incel is even kind of just thrown out as like an insult. Um, but yeah. also, I think very important to understand that what we're doing here is mainly we're judging incels by the most extreme actions or uh, words of a minority within their community. And usually when a group, well, first of all, usually when a group is disenfranchised, we try to prop them up in society or at least have sympathy for them. But we also really try to not judge them by the most extreme actions of a minority within that minority. So for example, uh, we don't see Muslims as terrorists because of an example of an extreme minority. However, we very much do this with incels. And, you know, maybe it's just because people don't know that it is a minority, a a very vocal minority that is producing most of the hate. Um, So that would be a a really important thing. I think a a way to get maybe garner more sympathy for them is to dispel some myths as well. They're often reported as being kind of white supremacist, um, and uh, alt-right, far-right uh, movement. But actually, in our study, we found that fewer incels uh, than would be expected by chance uh, were actually white. So we had 64% uh, were white and 36% were, uh, roughly 36% were um, uh, a, a, a black, indigenous, or a person of color. Uh, so, you know, that uh, in a, a lar- majority US and UK sample, that's quite... A lot. That's actually mm-hmm. over-represented people of color. 
In terms of political differences, we asked a question about political affiliation as well, and we found no differences between incels and non-incels. 39% of incels reported being right-leaning in their political um, affiliation, and 45% reported being left-leaning, with 17% uh, saying they were centrist. And uh, you know that was maybe an unexpected finding, but it kind of goes against a lot of the media that report that kind of uses the most extreme violent cases as prototypical of the incel movement. And uh, that, you know uh, even that itself goes against uh, guidelines for not giving notoriety to um, to incel to, to, to spree killers who want their notoriety. But we splash media reports about every incel act of violence or mm -hmm. incel threat. Um, you know, other studies have found that just 3% of incel posts online could be considered racist. And uh, that other studies have found that it's not really comparable uh, to, to, to white supremacism at all. And just to, to put that kind of media stuff into context, uh, you might have heard of the Alec Manasian case. So he's also alongside Elliot Roger, he's often um, he's often set out as like the poster boy uh, of the incel movement, but mm -hmm. he uh, th 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 he's actually been sentenced uh, in the last couple of days to 25 years for life. Alec Manasian is the guy who uh, drove his van in Toronto into the crowd and killed 10 people. Yeah, so yeah, if yeah. we if we think about incels, uh, the the death count associated with incels overall. Uh, is considered to be about 50 to 60. 10 of those alone can be attributed to Alec Manasian. He's the guy who in 2014 drove the rental van and killed 10 people in Toronto. And he put up this Facebook post saying, we will overthrow all the Chads and Stacys. all hail Supreme Gentleman Elliot Roger. We want to spark an incel rebellion, right? And in every media story, the Alec Manasian case is mentioned. But what's never mentioned is that last year, there was a judge's verdict on the case. Uh, he's just been sentenced, but in the judge's, ver judge's verdict, I'll read it uh, to you now. Uh, it says, he told lies deliberately to depict the killings as being connected to the incel movement and to get more media attention. He, mm -hmm. piggybacked, uh, uh, he piggybacked on the incel movement to ratchet up his own notoriety. His story to the police about the attack being an incel rebellion was a lie. So that's the judge's verdict after analyzing the case for you know far greater detail than us and in the media. Uh, so it's um, you know I think the media is responsible for sensationalizing the level of threat uh, here and uh, for the, our poor understanding of the topic. Yeah, this is this reminds me of the case of school shooters, for example. I mean, we already know that there's some copycatting here, and I mean, whenever the media present their photo and name, it it it's it's really a bad idea, and because some of them just want notoriety before they go out. So, right. absolutely, yeah, uh, I, I totally agree with that. And some, maybe the best thing in the media could be just stop stop talking about it you know because we could really uh, closer to home in in the uk we had uh, our first alleged incel attack uh, last year with the jake davison case and you could literally watch his youtube videos on the news and uh, you know you're, if you're thinking if you're an in incel or a spree shooter and um, that wants notoriety uh, attach yourself to the incel movement because you'll get on the, the news and splash the media you know it's a uh, that was an interesting case uh, in many ways because his relationship to the Jake Davison. So he's the guy that last year uh, he used a shotgun to kill five people, including his mother and a three-year-old girl. And he injured two others um, before killing himself. And it was the worst instance of gun violence in the UK in over a decade. Um, but again, with the media, so he, he, it was uncovered that he had YouTube channel with a lot of incel kind of, topics and he had been active on incel forums but i'll read for you now the words of the deputy senior national coordinator for uk counter-terrorism policing he concluded mm. that jake davison was not motivated by the misogynistic incel online movement the shooting was not terror related and the incel ideology is not a terrorist movement you also have the perspective of uh, a senior lecturer in terrorism studies who wrote a great paper about incels from a terrorism point of view. 
and uh, his name is Simon Cotty, and he suggests that it would be a mistake to categorize incel violence as terrorism because it does not advocate the use of violence as a necessary remedy for in-group defense. And I kind of tend to agree because it's not even clear that incels ever even meet each other offline. So you, know, you can imagine from a logistics point of view, if you were to create like a terrorism uprising or a group threat, logistically a nightmare. And I'm reminded of, have you seen the new Batman film with the Riddler? Uh, not yet, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, maybe I shouldn't spoil it. it it's not really... No, no, no go ahead. I okay. like spoilers. That, okay, that makes me want to watch the movie more. Okay, well, so the Riddler, he's this uh, maniacal kind of um, villain. And basically, he kind of recruits a lot of, um, you know, uh, disenfranchised young men who are basically kind of hinted at that they might be incels, uh, mm -hmm. that he recruits them to kind of go out and help him do his bidding. And I just kind of thought, how unlikely that really would be to be able to recruit people, like the online recruitment, even of terrorism among jihadis is over-exaggerated, but it's not really the main vehicle for their recruitment. Uh, so it's it, like, it's just a logistical nightmare to organize and mobilize people using just online. It, uh, it can help, of course, and we've seen with like the Arab Spring and things like mm -hmm. that, right? You can use it to help, but that kind of, uh, that offline, motivation needs to be there as well. I think it's, it, it's, uh, it's over-exaggerated, I think. Yeah, so just, just changing topics, do you sure. think that particularly when it comes to the sort of <clears throat> black pill community and so on, that incels really get good advice from other people, particularly online? Uh, no, <laughs> I don't think they get good advice. Uh, yeah. from anyone and actually that's interesting that the the kind of where the incel movement came from there's a really good paper called the evolution of the manosphere and it talks about how it's like a pipeline from pickup artist communities straight to incel communities because yeah. what they suggest is happening or happened was uh, that people tried to the the pickup artist routines found out they didn't really work and then they were like oh well then i've tried the, the to gamify and to improve my lot and it didn't work so i must be an incel so that was an interesting kind of pipeline um so some of the advice uh, is given is oh it's not all about looks and of course we all have an example of somebody who uh, less attractive has an attractive girlfriend or can still get a girlfriend but i think it's more about looks than we're comfortable admitting and a good example of that is height and i can talk about that from a personal experience because there are some women that height is just a complete red line that uh, if you're below a certain height that they would not consider you. And they're, they're different in where they view that, but it really is, a, 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 that's a kind of a clear cut case. And it's also one that you can't really do anything about. So it's a little bit more about looks than we try to pretend. And also, you know, it's not that easy to compensate for a lack of looks with a great personality. It's not that easy to just develop an amazing personality. You're kind of, your personality is a very uh, stable construct across your lifetime anyway. So it's quite hard to change, especially if you're anxious. And it's also just like a little bit gaslighting to incels to suggest that it's all to do with a, a bad personality. And we have the, the halo effect that we consider attractive people having better personalities anyway. And there's also examples of men with bad personalities who are very sexually successful. Um, another piece of advice that incels get is just lift, bro. So they say, just go to the gym and get, get muscly and that will help. And okay, it might help a little bit. Muscularity is attractive to some extent to women, but it's actually more attractive to men or men think it's more important. So women tend to want like just a, a nice toned body. They don't really tend to like the big uh, uh, muscle bound hunk and it's kind of a bit demeaning to women's taste to say oh all you need to do all incels need to do is just hit the gym and then women are so superficial they'll just want them uh, so that's um that that doesn't really work and it's also kind of a bit dismissive to the many incels who report having physical disabilities because there's not much they can do uh, in many cases uh, in the gym um but i'm I, so although i talked about this pipeline 
problem of pickup artist and there's problems in the pickup artist world. I, I think it is quite misogynistic and uh, manipulative and uh, and all that. But I still kind of believe that there must be hope for a like an ethical pickup artist <laughs> out there because you know self development is it, 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 the goal of attracting a, a mate is what motivates a lot of men to self develop and to succeed and to seek status. But it's actually when you attach the explicit goal that I'm developing myself because I want to get a girlfriend, that becomes almost seen as misogynistic and I, I don't really know why. So for example, do you remember last year or two years ago maybe, Barack Obama wrote his autobiography mm -hmm. and in it he had some chapters where he talked about at college how he started reading specific books to impress specific women. And he read a yeah. Marxist book to impress the Marxist girl in his class. And <laughs> he, he talked about this and quite relatable to, I think, probably most men. But he was lambasted as, oh, misogynistic. How, how could you have that as the goal that you were so manipulative? And I kind of thought, come on, <laughs> you know. But yeah, so I do think there maybe is a space yeah. for uh, better advice um, for incels. And I, I personally do think that the self-development route is the best way to go. It's, a, it's the one I would choose. But I, I, I temper that by saying it's not my place to say to incels, come on, pick yourself up by your bootstraps and improve yourself. Because that, like I said, that engaging with the mating market could be actually quite anxiety inducing. And it might be not the best thing at, at always for incels. Yeah, I, I mean, just before asking the next the next question, that bit about Barack Obama reminded me of that joke by Woody Allen, where he says that he doesn't really like reading the Russians. He only does that to attract women. Otherwise, he would rather prefer watching baseball. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, it's like, but it's kind of an unspoken fact that a lot of what's motivated men to seek status and to go out and achieve is the idea that it comes with the the bonus of you get the girl you know it's a no. i know it's a bit of an archetype but it's been kind of that female reward system has been keeping the whole evolutionary show on the road for a long time so maybe we shouldn't sneer at it yeah so i mean that's the advice they get <laughs> but what do you think would be the best advice for incels and do you think that evolutionary psychology can also help you uh, yeah, certainly. So there are books like Glenn Gare's uh, Mating Intelligence, which kind of shows that, you know, it, the, the the mating arena isn't as fatalistic and black pill as perhaps the incels might think. Um, I think the, an uncomfortable truth is that it takes a lot of persistence that, like I said, to get sexual success, you have to be rejected a lot. And, you know, that can be uncomfortable maybe for everyone including the women having to do the rejecting. Um, but th th that is maybe the case. I do think the self-development route is worthwhile. And I do think a lot can be done uh, for men because what women find attractive in men is more changeable with maybe the exception of height. Um, you know, you can kind of make yourself a little bit more physically attractive. You can uh, be more successful, get more high status. Uh, it's more alterable than perhaps uh, male mate preferences. Um, I also think that the modern world now with dating apps, you're basically in the biggest uh, status arena in the world and you're comparing yourself in status to everyone around. So what I think you need to do is find your own niche area and create your own status game. So there are a million different ways you can create a new domain. So for example, there would be no point in me trying to go out and impress uh, a very glamorous girl in a nightclub who wanted the Love Island style guy who's, you know, a gym hulk and very flashy. But at maybe like an intellectual debate or in university or conference where I'm talking about what I'm passionate about, maybe then I can blow someone's hair back. You know, it's like, it's like that's, that's my arena compared to like nightclubs. So maybe like finding where you're, yeah, create your own status game, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I guess that uh, taking a psychology course also helps because the sex ratio is in your favor, right? <laughs> right, yeah, for sure. That, that, that's real tough, Ricardo, you know. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. So, I mean, but taking into account that uh, there have always been incels in human societies and it will probably always be, there will probably always be incels in human societies. Uh, would you consider alternatives? Like, for example, I've had an entire interview with Diana Fleischman on the show about sex robots. And at a certain point, she said that uh, that could be a plausible alternative for uh, incels, for example, and also things like pornography, etc., even eventually prostitution, I don't know. Do, do you think that, would you consider those alternatives? Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with uh, Diana's arguments on this, and they're very like thought-provoking and compelling. She wrote a great piece called Uncanny Vulvas, <laughs> which is, a, I, lo I love that title. Um, and that whole idea is around that, that incel or men might be just getting what she calls counterfeit fitness cues from mm -hmm. seeing the visual cue of pornography, of a sex happening, ejaculation, and that kind of causes the algorithm in the brain to think I'm achieving evolutionary success. And that online worlds kind of hijack uh, our native status seeking mechanisms so that would mm -hmm. kind of explain maybe why we don't see even more violence from incels because it's kind of like they're being pacified by the online world uh, which mm -hmm. you know that might not be good on one level but it's maybe better than the alternative of them out causing trouble uh, on the streets um, I, I know that you've talked uh, I think with Rob Brooks as well um, mm -hmm. about uh, he has a, a book called artificial intimacy that explores uh, similar stuff. And yes, I, I do find it compelling. And I do think the technology, probably virtual reality software will get there faster than the hardware of robots, in my, in my opinion. But uh, I do think it would probably reach a, a level of where it would be sufficiently um, entertaining enough for, for, for men or for incels, and that will cause its own set of problems. But what it won't solve is the status element. And that's mm -hmm you know, there, I don't anticipate there will be a future world where having the most expensive sex robot is a thing that men will brag about down at the bar. <laughs> Maybe, I mean, like you, you brag about having the most expensive car, maybe it will just become like that. But um, I just don't see it really reaching that status level. There's a big difference between being able to get sexual success, which anyone could do now with a sex worker, or you could go see a, a sex worker, uh, but there's a big difference between that and uh, achieve, being sexually selected. And incels kind of talk about this uh, almost in a purity kind of way, that it's um, that uh, unfettered desire, that they want to be really desired, not just mm -hmm. have to trick someone into sex or get them when they were too drunk or whatever it might be. They want to, they, they, they think they're closed off from feeling fully desired. Um, so it's a little bit more complex than just getting sex. But do you think that in modern industrialized society, men have it harder when it comes to mating than in, for example, the traditional societies we evolved in? Um, there is an argument to be made for this because, uh, and it might actually, this idea of evolutionary mismatch, which is the idea that our psychological mechanisms now operate in a world that is meaningfully different from uh, the world in response to which they evolved, and so if we think about that relating to incels, uh, in our ancestral environment for most of our uh, evolutionary history, you would have had maybe a dozen or uh, a couple of dozen potential mates in your lifetime. Uh, and persistent sexual rejection would be perceived as catastrophic. You know, it's like, oh no, I'm running out of chances and my reputation of other women have seen me be rejected. Oh no, it's gonna cascade to the bottom. Whereas now, with uh, big cities, transportation, dating apps, you can, you know, first of all, you can have so many different options. It maybe messes with people's mating psychology that they think they're less likely to commit because they think, oh, well, there's, there's other options out there or I can, mm -hmm. I, can, I can aim higher. And the problem with that from like a, a, a gendered or a sex point of view is that for women, if they mate up in a dating uh, in a mating market, if they get for the uh, um, a higher mate value man, he will mate down to her level for a short term mating, but he mm -hmm. won't commit to her. So she yeah. might be getting the cue. Oh, I got with this great guy on Tinder two weeks ago. That's my level. And then she will ignore 
the people who are actually her level and she, she will keep going with the guy that the stereotypical chad who when he's in a minority at the top he's kind of reluctant to commit so it, it that kind of messes with that psychology but also just the dating apps an incel could receive more rejection in one day than would be possible in a lifetime in our ancestral environment and maybe that's kind of amplifying uh, more negative effects for well-being uh, among incels yeah i mean perhaps something like the paradox of choice also operates here because since we have supposedly so many options available also because we are exposed to pornography and i mean it, it probably tweaks the particularly the male brain into thinking that there are many more sexually available women out there than there really yeah. are i mean and when it comes to trying to settle choosing a partner and settling down i mean probably we feel less satisfied than we would have if we lived in smaller societies yeah and uh, also just you know love and it's it's kind of presented as like a commitment device but it's actually uh, daniel conroy beam has presented some interesting research that love is actually more like a commitment maintenance mechanism that's calibrated against the availability of other uh, options. So, mm. uh, which might maybe, you know, it's that old kind of archetype of men are as faithful as their options. I think that about maybe people in general, um, but yeah, they could be getting the cue. You walk through a big city, you see thousands of different options. That's an evolutionary novel feature of modern society. Um, but also something to think about is that we're more responsible for our own mating than ever. Usually you would have had kin and parents who would make an uh, alliance. Uh, arranged marriages, right? Right. Yeah. So uh, it's kind of, I remember talking to my friend in, in Birmingham in university, uh, he was an Indian uh, guy in the UK. And he told me when we were having drinks one night, he said, you know, all this partying we're doing now, uh, that will come to an end for me when I finish university. And, my parents will arrange marriage for me. And I was kind of like, whoa, how, how, do, you, how do you feel about that? You know, you know, your freedom will be gone. And he says, oh, no, it's kind of relaxing, really. I don't have the pressure you have to go find, to find a mate. And I kind of like, it was a, such a worldview changing conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's very interesting. I also, I, get, I guess that I think I read recently that in some parts of China, that still happens nowadays so they have arranged marriages yeah i, I mean uh, perhaps maybe a bit too controversial to say but uh, i believe they're doing some incredibly uh, harmful things with the uyghur muslim community there where mm. they're like forcing those women to mate with low status chinese no. men uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that's something we can include on the podcast but <laughs> Uh, well, perhaps let's not go down that yeah, route. <laughs> for, for sure, <laughs> stick on path. <laughs> yeah. So with that in mind, I mean, the issues about our modern mating market, if you want to call it that, do you think that at least some of the complaints expressed by incel, incels are right? Yeah, I do uh, to some extent because, and this is the conclusion of Rob Brooks as well, uh, him and Candace Blake and uh, another colleague uh, wrote a, a great paper uh, on showing how incel activity online is linked to the social mating ecology, so mm -hmm. to information about the local mating ecology. So they, they concluded that incels are kind of partially accurate about the socioeconomic factors contributing to their plight. Uh, so it's all part of what I would describe as like the kind of the social problem of what I can talk about as like the wider mating crisis. And uh, if you'd like, I could talk about that a, a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so it basically means in a nutshell, there are less eligible men on the mating market for women to choose from. And it might be like an uncomfortable truth uh, that we need to reckon with that for our recent past, many women were settling for men that they didn't really desire out of strict social norms for monogamy and out of economic necessity. And that's really kind of disappearing. If I think about my own single female friends, uh, they don't, they're not looking to settle. They don't feel any pressure of, oh, I need to find a man. Okay, some do, but some of them are like, no, I'd rather be single than, uh, than settle down. 
uh, settle with someone I don't want. Uh, so Do, does we... that does that also have to do with men and boys lagging behind in terms of educational and professional achievement? Absolutely, that's exactly what I was, is contributing to this crisis. So it, it skews the sex ratio. So one feature of modern weird uh, cultures is the rates at which women are beginning to outpace men in education and even in the workplace up until the age yeah. of 29. So now it creates a, a moder modern women's socioeconomic success combines with their mate preferences for even more successful men, which there are fewer of, and it creates a culturally skewed sex ratio of highly educated and selective women to what's called economically unattractive men. And because these women are competing for a minority of economically attractive men, these minority of men are reluctant to commit uh, because the sex ratio that is in the minority kind of calls the shots. Um, and also because men are not unattracted to women of lower socioeconomic status, that skews the sex ratio even further. And this leads to what we, we've hinted at earlier of this kind of asymmetrical sex recession that disproportionately affects lower income young men. So some figures on that is that uh, you might have seen the, the study that shows that the share of US men younger than 30 reporting having no sex within the last year rose from 8% in 2008 to 28% in 2018. And other research that you might not have heard about is that compared to 2002, men overall had the same number of sex partners in 2013. But the top 20% of men had a 25% increase in sexual partners, mm -hmm. and the top 5% of men had an even more dramatic 38% increase. So it was really skewing. So we have a modern mating system that's kind of simultaneously polygynous and polyandrous. So one man with multiple women, one woman with multiple men. But the standard deviation of sex partners is small for women, but extremely high for men. So it means most women can get some partners, but some men get a lot of partners, while many others struggle to get anything at all. And just to go back to the, the Rob Brooks uh, and Candace Blake study, uh, so the, they were able to predict uh, geographic areas of high online incel activity uh, using three variables, high income inequality overall, low gender pay gaps, and male biased sex ratios, so fewer single women. Um, mm -hmm. So there is some other evidence, you know, this idea of the mating crisis is a con contested one. Some people think there is no crisis at all. And there is some evidence that points to a reduction in hypergamy that points to women in, in weird cultures are marrying men less educated than themselves, which I think is in, inevitable uh, if you think, consider how, how well they're doing socioeconomically themselves. So uh, that's inevitable. But oh, so, so the, the, there's a reduction in hypergamy. I haven't heard about that. Yeah, so it's complicated because uh, even in the study that points to this reduction in hypergamy, they say uh, the author is right that they can't speak to uh, the perceived difficulties in women in attracting mates. So it's not really clear how women feel about having to mate down. And mm -hmm. other evidence points to this mismatch idea that there's fewer men that women see as eligible. You even see some news articles about it where it says, broke men are hurting Americans' women's chances on the ma marriage market. And I, th I thought it was quite a, a crass way to put it. But this decline in hypergamy has appeared in lockstep with in increases in rates of female infidelity. So rates of male infidelity have remained pretty stable. But they've increased by 40% among women in the last half of a century. So as women have started to mate down, they've also began to have more affairs, which maybe you think is quite natural. They can, you know, using online, they have more anonymity. Uh, they're swimming in different circles if they're earning their own high, a lot of money. Uh, but another unfortunate and really kind of uh, worrying uh, finding is that a recent study just come out a couple of months ago uh, it's studied of over 21,000 women in 27 EU countries found that women who were higher educated or earned more than their partners were more likely to report all types of intimate partner violence. So mm. you can think about that, that it's insecure men who are the most dangerous to their partner when they feel like they have a chance of losing them. But there's a lot of evidence that points to the fact that they might actually lose them. So. I'm not, of course, I'm not defending any intimate partner violence, but, uh, you know, 
it, it's important to understand when and why that occurs. Uh, and my, my new supervisor, David Buss, wrote a great book about when men behave badly. Mm -hmm. And he yeah. talks about that this is a kind of a, like a risk factor danger zone if the man feels like he's just about to lose his partner. So those are some really kind of worrying findings that, in my opinion, point to a mating crisis and the solutions to which aren't really clear. And uh, just let me be very clear, I'm not saying that we should roll back the gains we've made in uh, sure. uh, women's liberation or anything like that. But we do need to think through some of the kind of problems, unintended consequences that maybe come with it. And uh, just another kind of statistic to kind of put the direction of travel on this mating crisis. It, it doesn't seem like it might wind down anytime soon. So the investment bankers, Morgan Stanley, they released a report where they forecast that by 2030, 45% of working age women between the ages of 25 and 44 will be single and childless, the largest share in human history, up from 41% in 2018. And they call this the rise of the she economy. And, you know, on, on one hand, great that, you know, women have options now to work full time, part time or not at all, you know, and can have career success. Um, and but on the other hand, is the idea of corporate giants seeing women's lives as something that can just help their bottom line as like mm. it, it's kind of at the expense of maybe developing a family, which a lot of women, you know, will tell you is really high on their priorities. Uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's not clear that that's in everyone's uh, best interest. So it's a it's an interesting time to be thinking about human mating. Well, it always is. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I think we, here we, we can go back to the comment I made when we were talking about singlehood. Of course, if people feel good about it, if they prefer to invest on their careers, for example, instead of having a family, having babies and so on. Of course, there's also demographic issues related to that. But let's put that aside for a second. I mean, if people feel satisfied with their lives as they are, I mean, that's OK, at least for me personally, I don't see any issue with that. But since we're talking evolutionary psychology here and it's pretty clear that as a sexually reproducing species, it's very, very important for us to try to attract a mate and have sex with them and reproduce. I mean, it's almost inevitable that the vast, vast majority of people will put high value on that achievement and I mean they won't be as satisfied with their lives as if they were with a mate. So. Yeah and I, I kind of agree with your libertarian sensibilities there that the more freedom and choice uh, is better and, and my, I find that kind of intuitive but it's if you make the mating market this way that it's uh, okay for, you know, it, it's fine to develop, go the single route or to just uh, go with the top guys at the top. That uh, kind of has a, uh, um, what is, what's it called? A domino effect on everyone else in the mating market because mm -hmm. everyone else it occupies the same kind of arena. And, yeah. uh, you know, what we're having is this kind of effectively polygynous mating market again, which has been, the preferential mating system for 83% of indigenous human societies were preferentially polygynous. Now, most mateships within those societies were monogamous. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, what we found was that uh, Joe Henrik, uh, have you had Joe Henrik on the show? Yeah, twice. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he wrote a great paper on the puzzle of monogamy. And he talked about how monogamy's main cultural advantage that uh, seem to be the more egalitarian distribution of women and uh, you know it because it, it... and uh, and also and that correlates also with the reduction in male violence right? of course yeah so cultures that practiced monogamy norms flourished because those men and families were kind of freed up for economic output rather than fighting for mates uh, mm -hmm. so you know if we're to return to that if we think that of that as a like cross-cultural set of findings it's important to not to consider that, you know, if, if that's the direction of travel we're going. Um, yeah, and it's, it's not clear to me really that, you know, women in polygynous societies that, you know, that you could make an argument that they're happier to share a high value mate, but they don't really, in, in those societies, I don't believe they get on so well sharing the mate. They, they, they're not too happy about it. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's a, a, an interesting time in human mating for sure. Yeah. 
So uh, one thing that I haven't asked you about yet: Do you mm-hmm. think that um, do you think that there w- there could be solutions out there for most incels? I mean that perhaps some of them have a sort of biased perspective on the mating market and perhaps if they put themselves out there a little bit more they would have some chance or a shot at least and perhaps if they changed some of their lifestyle let's say that perhaps they would get more opportunity in the mating market or do you think that really most of them taking into account their objective mate value do not stand much of a chance? Um, I think there's always hope. I'm quite optimistic uh, and that you can always change your lot in life. But um, I feel like the online dating and how online dating is kind of the ubiquitous mating arena now, that really mm-hmm. exacerbates this attraction inequality uh, problem. So. My, yeah. um, my former supervisor and co-author, Andrew Thomas, and his uh, colleague, uh, Peter Jonasson, who I believe you've had both of them on the show, right? Uh, Andrew Thomas, yes. The other one, I don't think Peter so. Jonasson of Dark Triad. Mm. Stuff. Uh, I thought, I, I, thought oh, I heard it. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I had him, I had him. Sorry. Yeah. I, I was, I was mishearding the, the names. <laughs> okay. Uh, so they did a, a recent huge online dating study. They analyzed 1.8 million online daters from 24 countries. Great data to be able to get. And they basically what they did, they created a measure of how much interest each profile was getting. So like they called these indicators of interest, IOI. So it included like messages, likes, winks, any kind of attention. And they then also compiled a measure of what they called competence, which was like a person's income and level of education. And some of their findings, their first initial findings revealed like extreme inequality in the online mating market. So most users had barely any attention. Uh, often nothing at all, while others had hundreds of messages. So it's really exacerbating this uh, kind of skew, this uh, inequality. And I, I mean, I don't know if this is up to date or not, but I think it was, I read a study from uh, 2018 or something like that done on Twitter that um, women rejected uh, like right away 80% of men or something like that. Right. Yeah. So they they found a big sex difference in their study as well. Uh, So the sex difference they found that for a person of average competency, so a person who had some college and earning approximately £30,000 per year, for a man, this guy, this person would receive approximately eight indications of interest, uh, while women received more than three times this amount with 26. And even high competency men uh, they rec- so guys with master's degree and earning £75,000 per year received almost 90% more attention on average compared to 40% for women. Uh, so, you know, and, and re- this idea of resource acquisition ability, it improved the romantic attention received by men at almost two and a half, 2.5 times the rate of women. But still, even those highly, comp- so it, it had a way larger effect for men but still even those high competent men received less attention than women with low levels of competency. So it's a massive inequality among men who's getting attention and then a a sex difference in the the attention at all. So, you know, if you think about online dating sites, uh, their kind of business model is designed around keeping people single and they're not Mm -hmm. really, and they're designed around showing people attractive profiles. So there's even like reports that they're not showing uh, very unsuccessful profiles or even getting shown to people. So it's like a race to the bottom that the worse you do, the worse you get. And it's really kind of, it's it's a bit bleak to think about when we think about how ubiquitous the online dating is now. I think it was like upwards of 70% of couples now report to have met online. Uh, So it's like, you know, it's, it's all well and good me saying, Online dating exacerbates attraction inequality. You should get offline. But if that's the mating arena, it's not that easy to say, oh, I'm just, I'm I'm, I'm going, I'm going offline. I'm thinking about, I had a colleague in my previous professional life and she always used to complain about, I'm finding it very hard to meet someone. I really want to, really want to meet someone, but I'm not going online. 
And I was like, okay, when are you going to meet someone? You leave work here at 5 p.m., you take the train home, and you stay home, and you come into work again in the morning. Are you hoping to meet someone on the train? Is that, <laughs> that's your amazing market. You know, you, you kind of, at, when you're, everyone is so busy now, and also when, you know, I, I, I'm not speaking about her and myself, but workplace romances are now not allowed, almost, uh, because of Me Too, you kind of, it's, it's uh, maybe for good reason, they're not, they're not allowed, but a lot of people met their partner at work. You know, a lot of, a lot of couples talk about how they met their partner at work. And if that's, you were taking that away, then people really only have the online system to meet people. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you agree with this or not, but recently Douglas Kenrick released the book Solving Modern Problems with the Stone Age Brain and he has an entire section on mating. And one of the solutions he proposes, because we have online dating and all of those issues you just described with it, is to try to mate more locally. I mean, through friends, through people like that, people we already have connections with and... Uh, I mean, I just interviewed him and his son yesterday. I mean, we're recording this, by the way, on June 17th. The interview will be released on June 23rd. So when this interview is out, that one will already be out. Uh, but Great. anyway, uh, I suggested that perhaps uh, doing that would also help with personal interaction because, I mean, being online and just texting, I mean, text basically is nothing you don't have the tone of your voice the facial expressions your posture and so on i mean lots of information people can take just from your body let's say and how you speak and so on that i mean by mating locally perhaps you can increase uh, your success just yeah. by providing a potential mate with that sort of information so. yeah i think so uh, i mean I, I kind of agree and i'm reading that book right now actually as well uh, it, it's great evolutionary mismatch is like kind of my, one of my favorite topics from evolutionary psychology particularly around mating because it's so easy to see how it is so radically different from our ancestral environment and yes i like this idea of like dating more locally but to a movement like that it can't really be done just by the individual. It has to be a cultural shift. And okay, maybe maybe I'm a, I was a bit too uh, bleak about the online dating earlier because as I'm in London right now and I was coming through the tube system and I saw posters for uh, this kind of new movement where uh, a company has hired out a bar for and, the, and on these dates, they're only going to allow singles in. And you follow this yeah. QR code and it's like, meet people in real life, get off the apps. So there is a hunger for people to, to do this. And so maybe there will be a cultural shift. That would, that would be interesting to see. Um, but yeah, I think like recruiting your, uh, your, your kin, your network is important. And people are maybe embarrassed or shamed about that. It's a lot of pressure on the individual now to sort out your own mating. You know, you can rec recruit some help, but I suppose people are, maybe embarrassed uh, they don't want to create difficulty in the friendship by uh, you know if it didn't work out with their friend or something like that but back to this idea around evolutionary mismatch so things like you mentioned uh, the sound and everything <laughs> from my point of view that's a, that's a big one that resonates with me because on an online dating app whenever i've been been on there in the past i've always quickly with someone i liked tried to send a voice note because <laughs> I know voice is important and I know no. an Irish accent is pretty good. So <laughs> I always try to, try to use that one when I get the chance. Yeah. But also think about things like smell and like oh, uh, yeah. kind of compatibility of the immune system. A lot of women <laughs> will tell you they really like the way a guy looks, but when he gets close to them or when they were kissing or whatever, they, it really put them off that there was just no chemical kind of. And I think that's a poorly understood and, and maybe we should try to understand it a bit more of what people find attractive, like on a kind of chemical level of smell, of factory cues. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, I mean, apart from that, do you have any other solutions to deal with this sort of mess we have in modern mating? Uh, I think, like, it, it is kind of like a social problem. And, you know, uh, Rob Brooks and Candace Blake's study point to the idea that you know, reducing inequality, you know, uh, wholesale would help. And that would be uh, this mating crisis. It isn't just affecting incels. It's affecting 
higher educated young women as well, a lot. Uh, yeah. And uh, so it's, it's for everyone to think about. And, you know, we talk about inequality so much, but, you know, you and I joked about, oh, the idea of me being a minority male in psychology. But like being a minority of male in university is an even bigger one. And it's a very important one if we consider how women view that in their mate preferences. So you can have one attempt to try and equal things out on that front. But I think also we could have a cultural conversation around because uh, mate preferences are very sensitive to cultural like status and um, to culture, what we reward uh, culturally. So if we started maybe assigning status to a wider variety of traits in men, like one, for example, could be being a stay at home dad. That's not mm -hmm. considered that sexy, right? <laughs> but if it was, that would do two things. It would help a lot of men who might not be great in the modern uh, working environment, might not be uh, so suited to that, but maybe they'd be a great father figure and that would free up women to pursue their career. You know, th that would like be uh, meeting both goals there, um, but it just doesn't happen. So the, the, the rate, the, the speed at which women have got into the workplace and got great success on that, we haven't actually got men back into the home as much and women actually haven't started to reward that as a mate preference. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have any studies on this. Uh, I do have one actually, uh, where 5% of women said that they desired uh, a relationship with uh, where they would work full time and mm -hmm. uh, the partner would work part time or not at all. Just 5%. So that's, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty low. But um, even anecdotally, my friends, my female friends, they don't really find stay at home dads that sexy. If they do, yeah. it's, it's a guy who's achieved great economic success and then decided, I'm going to take a few years off and be involved. With the <laughs> yeah, but he, know, probably still, but he probably still has lots of money. So. He already had it. Yeah. And I call this for men, the obligation of success. So I, I say if a woman, a modern woman now can leave uh, school and decide to work full time, part time or not at all and still have a chance at getting the high status mate. A man okay. cannot do that. He has achieved success, achieved success, or achieved success. He can't decide, I'm going to try and, or he's a very rare type of guy that can uh, be Man uh, Machiavellian enough to decide, I'm going to target a rich woman and stay at home. It just, it, it just is not really a, a viable option in the same way. Yeah. Well, I mean, perhaps uh, if nothing else works, you have the option of trying to mating down the attractiveness scale. Right. Yeah. And uh, perhaps that, that, that's what needed. But like we said, uh, so men, you know, when, when we talked about auto incels simply have too high standards, something I didn't mention is that there's no guarantee that women will, uh, we will want them still. So it's not like, mm -hmm. Those women who might, who the incels might see as lower than them, they still want a higher man than the incels. So it's, yeah. it, it doesn't really help if you, lowering your standards doesn't achieve anything. Okay, great. So, Will, just before we go, let me ask you the most important question here. Who will win the World Cup? Oh, God. <laughs> I, I had to ask this one because Portugal beat Ireland. So. I know it, it was a Ronaldo masterclass. It was devastating. Like it, I thought we had a great chance. Um, yeah. So without Ireland in it, I'm kind of torn now because I've spent the last 11 years of my life living in England. Uh, yeah. And, you know, it's not that easy to support England as an Irish man. But during last year's Euros, I, I kind of had just reached that stage where I think I could after 11 years. If, if Ireland weren't playing, I, I would have supported England. But now I'm about to move to Austin, Texas. So maybe I'll support USA, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I'll, I'll just uh, uh, I'll watch for the entertainment and the, the halftime shows. <laughs> well, support Argentina then. <laughs> right. OK. Yeah, maybe I, I would like to see Messi win an international big tournament. Yeah. But I wouldn't like it to be so clear that uh, he's done something Ronaldo hasn't. That would be. Yeah. I don't know. I don't want that to be settling the argument, you know. <laughs> OK, great. So where can people find you on the Internet? Uh, so uh, I spend far too much time on Twitter uh, for my for my sins. So it's at Costello William uh, at Twitter. So the, the inverse of my name. And uh, yeah, that's the best way to keep up to date 
uh, with all our stuff, my, any of my conference presentations or papers, I'll, I'll make sure to, to post about them or any studies we're doing. Okay, so look, man, it was great to have you on and I wish you all the best with your PhD with David Buss. I mean, I've had him three times on the show and he's awesome, a great researcher and writer. So all the best for you and I hope to have you again on the show somewhere in the future after your PhD is done or something like that. Yeah, super. Thanks for having me, Ricardo. Really, it was a great experience for me. And yeah, the, the move to the bus lab is a, a dream move for me. Yeah. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even $1 per month, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett Perga, Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Greg Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Vissel, Jacob Linkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolfkin, Tim Hollis, Ian Ricalenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, George Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Ugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenk, Wal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslin Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dimitri Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roff, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Denise Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, and Max Belby. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafinia, Kian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Sardis France, Thomas Trumbull, and Nuno Welder. And my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.